Okay, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, my name is Teacher Mikey, and I work here at the Junior Museum and Zoo. I know my little tag says John Aiken, who is our director, um, but this is his account. So, um, thank you so much. We're so excited. This is actually our first Zoom. We're calling it a webinar Zoo time with um, Mikey and Molly. Molly is actually on the keyboard right now, um, but we'll be switching back and forth. So I'm just gonna um, set up like how we're gonna structure this a little bit, and then we'll get started. But thank you for bearing with us because um, this is our first time. Um, so let's see, we are in shelter in place at the zoo. And so we are going to try a webinar, um, in terms of structure on this, we are going to ask if you have questions to use the question and answer, um, function at the bottom of your screen, you should find it. If you go down to the bottom, um, it says question and answer. And what that'll allow us to do is, um, Molly's on the computer. So she'll be able to moderate those questions. Um, and throughout our little lesson we have today, um, there will be multiple times that will pull out some of those questions and answer them. So you don't need to raise your hand or use the chat function, um, but if you have something that you wanna ask, feel free to use that. And we're gonna keep um, a recording of it. And so we'll either answer those questions at the designated question times, or um, if there are questions that we can't get to or we don't know the answer or anything like that, um, we have your email. So we'll send out at the end of this webinar um, before the next one, kind of a debrief on any of those questions that we didn't get to. So if you do ask a question and we don't answer it, check your email um, because that's where your answer will be, okay? Um, the other thing I wanna mention before we get started is because we are sheltering in place and everyone's supposed to be quarantined, um, you might see Molly and I get really close to each other or touch each other. Um, we're actually roommates. So <laughs> we've been sheltering in place and quarantining together, which is why we can do this super cool um, webinar together. So don't worry about us not social distancing because we keep close quarters. Um, is that it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, if for some reason there's any problems, um, you're going to use that question and answer and Molly can get to it. Um, but if there are actual animal questions, then, um, we'll take those when we get through animals. Okay. So we are so excited. This is supposed to be one of hopefully seven or eight, um, Zoom webinars we're going to do, and they're all going to be, um, fo focusing and featuring our animals that live here at the zoo. Um, since, since shelter in place started, um, obviously life is different and that is true for our zoo animals too. Um, they are missing and maybe curious where you guys are, where the visitors are. They're used to people coming in and out of here um, and getting to engage and see a lot of different faces. And that's even true of our animals that aren't on display. Um, we have a pretty big staff that is used to coming in and out. And so these animals are used to seeing a lot of different faces and that's gone from a big group to a smaller group now. Um, our zookeepers, we have four zookeepers. So there's zookeeper Rob, who's our zoo director. And then we have um, zookeeper Lee and zookeeper Marlin and zookeeper Mickey. So those four, um, in addition to myself and Molly and teacher Anne, if you guys know her, are our list of essential workers. So only the seven of us um, are basically allowed to come into the zoo right now. And then we're making sure that all the animals are taken care of still and getting their diets and getting cleaned and exercise and all that good stuff. So they're still being taken care of, um, but they, I'm sure that they do miss the engagement from the public and from other people. Um, so, but besides that, things are pretty similar. We'll talk at the end about um, how, how we're kind of changing in life and you guys can give me some ideas about what you've been doing to keep yourself safe and healthy. And those might be some of the same things that we've been doing or that we've been doing for our animals. Um, but the first thing we're gonna talk about today, our first lesson um, about our zoo animals is gonna be about adaptations because that is something that we're all doing right now. So some of my friends um, might know an adaptation is something that an animal either has on its body or does in life to help it survive. And right now we are all surviving and we're all doing the best we can to um, stay really safe and really healthy. And so you guys are actually probably doing some things that you normally don't do to adapt. Um, and our animals do that all the time. And so there are different types of adaptations, um, but we're gonna meet an animal right now. Um, and I want you guys to help me figure out its adaptation, okay? And for those are friends who um, have been at the zoo a lot, you guys probably know a lot of our zoo animals. So if you do have any information or things that you're not sure about or you wanna share, go ahead and use that question and answer button, okay? So. Um, Maybe a master of adaptations is our walking sticks. Um, yeah, I will. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna open this up and what I want you guys to do is see, and go ahead and again, use the question and answer function. See if anyone can tell me, go ahead and type your guesses, how many walking sticks do I have in here? And teacher Molly is looking through your answers right now and she's gonna tell me if we get any correct answers. There's, there's multiple in here. So go ahead and see if you can count and tell me how many walking sticks you think are in here. Who's got it? I got it, it immediately. Who? Five. Who? Eva said five. Eva! Yes! 
There are five in here. Um, in our display out in the museum, we actually have a plethora, probably like a hundred at any given time. Um, but these guys are crazy. I'm gonna take out their little, their sticks right now and see if all five of them will stay on. Good job to Miss Eva. Okay. And also um, a couple other people guessed five. Five, okay. Brie, Brie, Stephanie, Carol. Whoa, good job guys. I guess that wasn't Stephanie that difficult. <laughs> good job friends so um, as I hold this here you guys can probably see these guys are masters of camouflage and camouflage is when something blends into its surrounding right or it doesn't doesn't stand out it, it hides very easily you guys probably play a lot of hide and seek I wonder if anyone's playing hide and seek at home right now when I was little I used to make my parents come and find me all the time <laughs> um, but that's kind of like what they're doing when you guys play hide and seek you're doing the best you can to make sure that you are not found, right? You want to you want to be hidden for as long as you can. And that's kind of what these guys do. They want to make sure that they um, can hide themselves because what that's going to do, it's going to allow them to protect themselves from predators. Um, their number one predator is birds. And so if you see, we have these sticks here because these guys are used to living on plants and sometimes up in trees. Um, and birds want to find their food where it's close to them. So these guys being able to hide themselves and blend into their surroundings is a super important way. Look at, he's on my hand. He doesn't camouflage quite as well. Um, he's on my leg. Um, but in a tree, they do camouflage well. So one of the things that their camouflage helps them to survive is also the amount the number of stick bugs that live together. Um, if there are hundreds of stick bugs living together at a time and I'm a bird and I come and take a big bite out of this branch, even if I get 10 or 15 walking sticks in my mouth, there's a really high probability that there's still gonna be a lot of walking sticks in other trees and other plants. So no matter how many walking sticks as a bird I can eat, because these guys live in big groups and can hide really well, um, they actually adapt by being able to reproduce and not getting wiped out by being eaten by other animals. Um, another really cool adaptation these guys have is that, um, is that <laughs> Mr. Beck, I see your hands. Go ahead and use your, go ahead and use your question answer um, and then that'll come up for Miss Molly. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, another thing these guys can do is they can actually all of our walking sticks are girls. They're all females. And we know this because they can have babies by themselves. Um, they don't need a male and a female. The females can just reproduce on their own. And the, the babies are actually genetic clones. They're like almost like identical copies of their parents. And so the fact that they can reproduce by themselves is a really cool adaptation. If you don't need another walking stick to have babies with, that's another way to ensure that you're going to be able to live for a really long time. I'm going to pull off one of these guys here and get us a better look up close at a walking stick. Okay, so get a really close look at this one right here. Um, Walking sticks are actually insects, and you can see, we can count actually the six legs that are moving all over the place. And if you look really, really closely, you can actually maybe see their little set of antenna there on their head. So one of the things that help these guys survive, besides being really well camouflaged and living in huge groups, is that they can, um, they can actually regenerate. So what that means is if I were to be like, a predator and actually rip off a leg, or if their antenna were to get ripped off of them, um, I could grow those things back. So imagine if like your brother was being really mean and he pulled off your finger and then the next day it started to grow back. That would be insane, but what a way to keep yourself alive and safe, right? Um, and when they start to regenerate, their little leg, their new growth is actually green. Um, and when the babies are born, the babies are green. And that's another way they survive is by blending in. Um, trees, we typically think, I think of a tree, I think of it being brown bottom, green top and so that they have the two colors that are found in the place they live is a really really helpful thing um, and their antenna those things are super important for them because that's how they can feel and see what's around them and their surroundings so if those get pulled off they're like pretty um they lost they lost something that helped them feel and this guy actually is missing a leg right here you can see he has five legs on his body um so they have all these things that are really really special i'm going to show you one more thing i'm going to put this guy back see if I can show you. They can stay really, really still too. If you look at these guys on the edge here, they're like out of the box, but they're holding on. They can be very, very still and look like sticks. 
Um, these walking sticks that we have are actually Indian walking sticks, but walking sticks can be found all over the world. We actually have um, different types in California, and they don't just look like just like our sticks here look. Sometimes they actually look like different leaves. They can be really prickly and almost have like sticky things out on the side of them. Um, I have a couple examples of molts here from um, some different types of walking sticks. So if you look at this here, you can see when they molt, it's actually how their bodies get bigger. So they shed or slink off kind of all of their outside exoskeleton. And underneath is a big, uh, stronger, bigger walking stick. And so as they, as they molt, this is a progression of from smaller to bigger, but and it might be really hard to see on this one. They actually have on here kind of like little kind of prickles along the edge that make them really pokey um, like leaves. So adaptations for walking sticks are camouflage, regeneration, reproducing by themselves, living in mass groups, and being able to, um, to molt and grow bigger. All right. Yes, Miss Molly. Okay, so what's going to happen? Sorry, guys, my didn't set this up clearly. Molly is going to read me the questions, and then I'll answer them for the walking sticks, okay? Thank you so much for your questions. Yes? Um, so this is a lot about reproduction. Okay. So a couple questions. One, do they have babies? Two, um, how many babies do they have? And how do the females lay eggs by themselves? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot of questions. So they do have babies. Um, they do lay eggs. Um, do you know the process that's called that it's called how they so there's a P. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so there's a name. There's a there's a name for the scientific process when we so this might be something that we follow up in on the email, but there's a name for the scientific process when an animal can reproduce by itself. Um it's more similar to cloning okay. than the way we reproduce, where we're a combination of our mom and our dads. Gotcha. These guys are basically mini versions of their mom. And they can mate with a male um, and have a baby that's more genetically diverse and has a better chance of survival. But the clones of their mom, if there's something wrong with the mom and she gets sick and dies, it's likely that all the babies will die as well. Thank you. Yeah, you're not muted, right? They could hear all that. <laughs> okay, sorry. So just to recap what Molly said, um, it's more like cloning than actually producing. So when you reproduce, you take the mom and the dad and you mix them together and that's what the baby is. But when you're cloning, you're just taking the DNA, the things that make us up of... Um, oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, sorry. My coworker texted me. You can hear me through Molly's mic. Perfect. Okay, so that's great. And then... <laughs> Um, sorry, one more thing, Molly, about that. Um, when they lay eggs, when they lay eggs, um, they usually, it depends on the insect, but they can have between 50 and 100 eggs at a time when they lay an egg sac. And so typically when we have our moms that clone here, um, we get so many. You can tell when the, the eggs hatch or are born because um, there's like a, an outbreak of these like little tiny, because the babies are really small and they're really green. Um, they're very fragile too. Like those walking sticks, I can pick them up and hold them pretty easily, even though they're small and fragile. The babies are even more so. You can't really pinch a baby, like you'll kill it. You have to kind of like get them onto your hand. And so when they have the eggs, there's like an explosion um, and there's a lot of them. Good question. Thank you so much. Okay, next. <laughs> um, can they actually walk? They can walk. Let me see if I can show you. Sometimes they don't want to walk. Sometimes they're a little um, temperamental. But if I put it on my hand, you can actually see the body move. And what they do is they act, they kind of use their front legs in addition to their antenna to be like, um, like almost like a walking stick to like, <laughs> like that people would use, right? Like if people have, um, sight issues, then they will use a walking stick to help feel and see what's in front of them. So they, they do walk. Um, it's not necessarily that fast. And it, when they're in their houses, they kind of are climbing because they have like a lot of um, lateral space. And so they, they walk, but it's just, it's not the same way maybe that we would walk. Their legs all move at different times, if you can see that. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to save the rest of the questions. We have time for other answers. Okay. Um, but I can try to take some answers. Um, and then if you're raising your hand, please send questions through Q&A at the bottom of the screen. 
Perfect. Thank you guys so much. And like I said, this is our first time. At the end, I'm actually going to tell you how to um, send us some anonymous feedback on what worked and what didn't work about this. So if you have, if there's like technical difficulties or something, you're like, this is a horrible idea. Uh, <laughs> you can submit this at the end. I'll let you know how. So, um, but go ahead and use those questions and answers. Okay. Thank you guys so much. So our next animal that we're going to look at has a totally different set of adaptations. Um, and let me grab him. Okie dokie. So this is Zeus, and Zeus is, well, little story. Okay, so Zeus is a Greek tortoise is what we call him. Um, but we actually had other scientists and other people tell us that he's a Russian tortoise, um, and we kind of are in a torn situation because how scientists group and categorize turtles are based on a couple different things. One thing is based on the scoop pattern on the shell. One is on the tail, kind of like the shape and the size of the tail. Um, another one is actually how they pull their um, extremities, their head or their legs their arms into the shell and so scientists use all these different things to make different groups of turtles and currently they, they're always moving but currently there's 13 families of turtles and about um, like 250 something species of turtles but they group them into those families on those things I mentioned on the, the shells and the tails and so anyways Greek tortoises and Russian tortoises have a lot of similarities and it, it's basically impossible for us to tell what type of tortoise he is but he was given to us as a Greek tortoise and then his name is Zeus so we just we follow that but if someone is a turtle expert out there and it's like that's a Russian tortoise you're very plausible it could totally be a Russian tortoise um, but Zeus has adaptations that are really really cool um, go ahead and type for me guys what's what's a turtle's main adaptation what's the thing that is super special about turtles. You can tell me, Molly, when we get some answers on there. They're super cool adaptations. So look at his body. He has all these things that make him a super neat animal. But what's, what do you think is the main thing that protects him or keeps him safe um, as he's alive? Typing, typing, typing. His shell. His shell. Excellent. Thank you so much. So turtles have shells and we think they're super cool. And they are super cool because do you guys have a shell? I hope not. Okay, so he has a shell. And um, his shell, a lot of times, like I remember when I would watch cartoons when I was little and it would talk about, it would show like a turtle like leaving his shell and going to find a new shell. And that is just madness because this is actually his back. Um, if you take your hand and you feel you have a really big backbone that goes from the bottom of your neck all the way to the top of your bum, um, and that your back is super important. Our back is basically the thing that like holds our body together. It supports us. It, um, it bookends with our core. And so our back is really important. And just like our back is on the back of our body, a turtle's back is also on the back of their body. So um, his bones, he has bones just like you and I in his legs and his arms and in his back. And so the bones actually grow and they grow into his shell. So if I were to like hit him really hard or to drop him, he would 100% feel that. And that could actually break not just his shell, but also his bones. And so his adaptation is that his bone grows up into his shell and then his shell grows down into his bones. And his shell is made of a couple things, but the main thing that his shell is made out of is something called keratin. So if you feel your fingernails right now, our fingernails are made of keratin. And so I kind of try to imagine like, how would it feel if my fingernails grew really thick? Like if my fingernails were like that thick on my nail, like I could still feel that. It would be weird. It wouldn't be like touching your skin, but it would be like touching your fingernail. You could still feel that. So he can totally feel all the touches he gets and all the pets. Um, he lives with another tortoise and they can feel when they like bump into each other. Um, so his shell is really a really cool adaptation for not just how it grows and what it's made out of, but also what it does. So um, you can see right now he's really comfortable and really happy. He has all of his limbs out in his head. But if he was threatened, if he was scared, if there was a predator here, he would very quickly tuck all of these things hanging out, his arms and his legs and his head, back into his body. And um, he can do that in different ways. So sometimes, depending on the type of excuse me, turtle it is, he can pull his head straight back in. Sometimes they kind of have like an S. If you draw, if you draw an S, um, that's how they pull their head in. Instead of pulling it straight back, they'll pull it in in like an S fashion. Some of them have like a hook. So instead of pulling straight back or in an S, they'll take their head and they'll turn it right in like at a 90 degree angle. Um, and then he'll, he'll try to protect himself as best as he can. He has this hard rock covering around him, but he cannot actually close his shell all the way. There are only a handful of turtles that can close their shell all the way. A common one is called the box turtle and that they're called the box turtle because they literally have like a little box hinge that lets them completely shut their shell. So if he was threatened, he'd be able to pull all those parts in 
um, and protect himself. Sometimes in the wild, um, male turtles and tortoises will actually fight over a territory or over girlfriends or sometimes food, and their shell is a part of that. What they will do is they will sometimes pull their heads in and they'll like walk towards each other all turtly like, and then they're actually gonna hit each other with their shells. Um, on the bottom of his shell, he has something called a gular horn. Look at that little head. Um, and I'll show you, I have another shell I'll show you in a second, but they actually are trying to hit each other with those horns, and the idea is that they want to flip the other turtle or tortoise onto its back. Um, and in doing so, if a turtle gets flipped onto its back, it's really hard for it to get back up, but also to survive. Um, his lungs and all of his organs, similar to like us in our body, his hang between the top shell and the bottom shell. So if he's walking, his lungs are normal, but once he gets flipped onto his back, his lungs all of a sudden will become crushed by all of the other stuff that's inside of his body, which would make it really hard for him to breathe. So if he just gets stuck on his back for a long period of time, he could die. So not only is the shell an adaptation to protect him from something biting him and grabbing him, it's also something he'll use as like a tool to, to fight other turtles and to gain things like territory or food. Um, I want to point out his little claws on the end of his legs and arms there. Um, he, these are specially adapted for where he lives. If he was another type of turtle or tortoise, he would not have digging claws on the end. I'm going to show you a sea turtle real quick. This is a not alive hawksbill turtle. And if we look at the, um, the fins or the flippers on this guy, they're very different than Zeus's. There's no claws here. Um, and these are actually, again, adapted for where this turtle would live. Sea turtles are a type of turtle that actually I mentioned how Zeus can pull in his arms and legs and head. He cannot do that. Um, they do not live in the same environment and they're not adapted to pull in their limbs that way. So his limbs would always be out, but you can see that these are actually made, they're streamlined for swimming and for pushing water and for gliding. He doesn't need to dig in the dirt for anything. And so it wouldn't have the same type of legs as Zeus has. Like I said, his specially adapted, um, his specially adapted claws for digging. Um, I'm going to show you, I have a couple other turtle shells because like I mentioned, scientists use them to um, kind of categorize what type of turtle or tortoise this might be. These are called scoots, these special types of um, scales on this animal's body. And we, we use scoots in other ways, like snakes have scoots on their belly, but we call these scoots. And the scoots can actually be different patterns and different shapes. Some people think that the scoots are like tree rings where they can actually tell you how old the turtle is. And that's true, but it's not true. True. Um, scoots get bigger as an animal grows. So the more they have, the older the animal is. But it's not like a tree where you can cut them and that math balances out. It's not exactly like he has 10 scoot rings, so he's 10 years old. But it, we would know, we could get an idea about how old he is comparatively um, based on whether he has a few or many. Um, this is called a landings turtle. And if you look inside, it's really difficult. But if you look at the top here, you can kind of see how it's all connected, even on the side here. There's not a way for me to like take it apart, right? I couldn't take off the back and have the bottom. It's all connected. I'm going to show you one more. Oh. This is a good one. So this turtle here, you can see, I know, I'm sorry, there's a glare. Um, but you can see here how the back, there we go, how the back is actually connected straight through. And this open space is where all those other organs, like his lungs and his liver and stuff like that would be. Um, but this one has been taken off. So this is, this is the bottom part. Um, but in a real life turtle, it would be connected. And I'll show you one more thing. This is pretty cool. If you look at the, the bottom, you can actually see the little tiny bones that are in the tail. So those are like the feet and those are like the little tiny bones in the tail. Last, last one. Ooh, this is my favorite because you can actually see the, this is the, the vertebrae, this is the spine. So just like I mentioned, his backbone grows directly into the shell and then the top part doesn't look like that. The top looks different. This is where we see the scoots that I was mentioning. So this is like one scoot right here. Um, but this is all, all be connected on a turtle. Okay, Miss Molly, do we have any questions? Absolutely, I okay. have a series of food questions. So series of food questions, wonderful. Um, does he bite? What food does he eat? What does he eat? Oh my gosh, that's a good question. Okay, so. 
Um, does he bite? That's an excellent question. We get that question a lot with all of our animals. Um, and what we see at the zoo is that anything with the mouth can bite. You guys can bite, I can bite. But um, hopefully we don't go around biting people. We just eat our food, right? So it's the same thing with our animals. Um, they're used to being handled. It's kind of like their job to come out to schools or to meet people um, and to, to do stuff like this. And so as long as we follow the rules, they're not gonna bite. Um, he's capable of biting. If he felt really sick or he felt like he was in danger, he would totally be, he could, he could bite. But for the most part, because we work with our animals really well and we know their personalities, just like, you know, people, you know, people that are safe and that can help you. And then other people you're not sure about, right? So it's the same thing in the wild. I would never go up to a turtle and grab it because like, I don't know that turtle. It very well could bite me. Um, but here we know our animals and we know kind of their behaviors and their personalities. And so he doesn't bite. I, I wouldn't be scared to have someone pet him because I know um, how he is and kind of how he responds to those things. What does he eat is a really good question. Um, turtles and tortoises are a little bit different in what they eat. And because there's a lot of different kinds, it's hard to say exactly. Um, here at the zoo, they eat a lot of vegetation. So they eat things like shredded carrots, shredded cucumbers, um, a lot of lettuce, maybe flowers sometimes, depending. Um, in the wild, again, it depends on the type of turtle or tortoise and where it lives. Um, turtles actually can eat meat. Tortoises do not eat meat. So Zeus is a Greek tortoise, um, so he doesn't eat any meat, but turtles, especially like sea turtles that live in the water, they can eat things like um, little bugs or maybe some crustaceans or different like small, small meat that would live there. Um, but tortoises just eat plants. So if there are like desert tortoises or tortoises that live in the desert, they can actually, they have special adaptations to be able to help them to eat cacti um, and get into the water that's in there. So. Really good question. Um, what does this poop look like? It's, it's not great. It's like really watery. Molly, do you have any? You've seen more tortoise poop than I have. Um, his tends to be pretty white. White, yeah, like almost like bird poop. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's like a brown pellet. Um, Edward, our big tortoise, he has big, long brown poops. It kind of looks of like brown. human poop, but yeah, it's like full. <laughs> <laughs> really big though, really big, but but kind of what you would think poop would look like. These guys are, he's, he has different poop than yeah. Edward. Good questions, good questions. Um, yeah. we, we have time for what a couple a cool more, question. Molly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is Zeus, how old is Zeus, mm -hmm. and boy or girl? Yeah, so Zeus is a boy, and it's really, really hard with tortoises. Some animals, it's easy to tell whether they're um, male or female, but a lot of reptiles, it's tricky. So we know he's a boy because we've done blood tests on him. Um, but otherwise we wouldn't, we wouldn't really know. Um, and then how old is Zeus? Zeus, I don't know off the top of my head. He's in his late. Over 40. Really? Yeah, he's older than Arizona. She's in her 20s. Okay. Uh, we'll check on this. Well, Miss Molly says over 40. I did not have that. <laughs> I was going to say late 20s. <laughs> we can check. Well, before. Oh, they can live for a long, long time. Is that the question? No, it's just, okay. Question. Okay, it's not. So again, okay, so we'll check. We can get the answer on how old he is before this is over. Um, in terms of how long tortoises can live, some tortoises can live to be over 100 years old. It really depends. Sea turtles, again, can be, there are, um, there's records, of at least one tortoise that's supposed to be over 200 years old. He's lived through like three or four owners because he's outliving them. Um, but it depends on, again, like the specific type of turtle or tortoise. But most of them have longevity. I would say between like 50 and 80 is very standard, if not over 100. Really good questions. Um, I'm going to give you a couple more questions. Uh, I have a bunch about how many babies do they have and where do they lay their eggs? How do they lay their eggs? How many eggs do they lay? Yeah. Okay. Eight questions. Very cool. So, um, and I'm sorry that I'm repeating myself, but a lot of it has to do again on like the specific type of turtle or tortoise for how many they would have and where they would um, lay them. I'm going to show you the sea turtle again because I love to talk about how sea turtles lay their eggs. Um, if you are a mama sea turtle, you will actually come out of the water to lay your eggs, which I find so interesting. So they um, come out of the water at night and they go up onto the beaches and they actually will dig. And if you look, not great for digging, but maybe could do it in the sand. So in the sand, they, they dig and they lay clutches of eggs. So clutches is like a big one. And sea turtles, usually about 100 eggs. And the reason they lay so many is because not all of them are going to survive. So what the, they do is they actually will go up on the beach and they'll dig in the sand and they'll lay their clutch of eggs and they'll bury it. And then the mama sea turtle is going to go back to the sea and she's going to wait for her eggs to hatch. And so cool. 
what they what they'll do is the eggs will actually hatch at night and the baby hatchlings will use the reflection of the moon on the water to find which direction they're supposed to go so when they, they hatch they look for where the light is coming from and they'll they'll go toward the water but why there are so many eggs laid is because what happens is a lot of times the birds and the other predators in that area know when the moms come and lay their eggs and when they are ready to hatch. And so while the babies are trying to make their way back to the water, sometimes the other animals will prey on them, but that's why she lays so many is so that some of them will survive and make it back, which is really, really exciting. Um, there's actually scientists that study this specifically a lot, different types of turtle nesting sites, which is where they lay their eggs and then they come back to the water. Um, and there are cool maps you can look up online after this, um, where they're like, they've mapped out all these different sea turtle um, nesting sites and they actually will send scientists to some of the sites to protect them so that when the hatchlings hatch, um, that they can like protect them and get them back to the water without those other animals um, preying on them. That's, um, do you know about um, turtles laying their eggs on land? Tortoises? Yeah, so again, it depends on the species, but they have those great claws for digging. You saw Zeus's claws. Um, often they might dig one hole and lay all their eggs in a hole, or a female will dig a series of holes and lay a couple eggs here, just one, and then go to the next spot and maybe dig 50 holes each with an egg or two in them. Um, over a series of time when she's ready for the eggs are fertilized and they come out. Again, tortoises and turtles, as soon as they lay their eggs, they abandon them. So they dig a hole, they lay the eggs, and they're gone. There's a type of turtle in Florida that actually lays their eggs in alligator nests. And then the alligator mama is protecting her eggs and she also protects the turtle eggs. A very cool adaptation. That's so smart, right? The mom tortoise knows turtle to let, to hatch her eggs there where they're going to be protected by an even more bigger uh, animal, bigger predator. Okay. And is that good for? Yeah, we okay. have um, lots more questions yeah. that we don't have time to get to right now. We'll have to look up when Zeus's birthday is. Yes, I will go check on that very quickly. But I'm so, gonna get yeah, yeah. So what we're going to do, friends, is um, I'm actually going to pop off screen and Molly is going to pop on and do our last animal. Um, and the reason is you'll actually see, so um, because of um, shelter in place and quarantining, we have some new protocol that we're doing to keep ourselves and the animals safe. Um, and I'm sure, or maybe you guys didn't hear, there was a tiger in the Bronx Zoo that tested positive for COVID-19. Um, and so there's a lot of precautions now about around mammals, specifically in zoos, and how to keep them really safe. Um, so in just, we're just going to do a quick clop. It'll take about 30 seconds, and you'll see Molly pop on screen. Um, she might look a little different, but she's going to talk to you about um, our mammals here and what we're doing to protect them, and um, we'll swap places, and then we'll be back. Okay, thank you so much. All right, hello. Hopefully you can hear me through my mask. Um, this is so if anything comes out of my, ma my mouth, uh, it won't get onto the animals and I'm wearing gloves and I washed my hands while well, I was using I was using hand sanitizer washing them is uh, better but I wash them at the beginning of the day and then I put hand sanitizer on I want to talk about mammals were mammals we haven't seen any mammals here yet today mammals have fur on their body or hair see if you guys can find your hair um, and the babies drink milk that the mom makes from her breasts um, or teats, depending on the type of mammal. And then mammals have backbone, so they have spines. And they've adapted in lots of different ways. And they've adapted different diets. So I'm going to show you some skulls, some real dead animals and their teeth. And we're going to talk about different diets. Cool. All right, this is a kangaroo that would have lived in Australia. Um, and you can take a look at these teeth, okay? Are they smooth and flat? Are they sharp and pointy? These guys have teeth that have been adapted to eat plants. So what they do is they take these flat molar-like teeth and they grind up leaves and hard to digest food. And they actually have these long teeth in the front to clip off leaves and pieces of grass. And then they grind, grind, grind that plant matter, and they're called an herbivore. 
So they have adapted to eat plants. Sorry, I was fogging up my glasses, so I took them off. This is a coyote skull, and you can see these teeth are much sharper and pointier. We call these ones the canine teeth. So we have two canines on top, two canines on the bottom, and these are carnivores. They eat meat, only meat. So these are meat eaters. We are omnivores. That means we have the ability to eat both plants and meat. We have sharp canines in the front, and then we have our molars in the back for grinding up our salads and our fruits and veggies that we like to eat. So we're om nom nom nivores. <laughs> All right, okay. I wanna show you a real live mammal that we have here at the zoo. These are our ferrets. This is Duncan and this is Yo-Yo. And they have, whoops, they have so many cool adaptations um, and they are very energetic and playful. And when they were babies, sometimes their mom just wanted them to relax and chill out and to get them to sleep, she would grab them by the scruff of their neck. That's this extra skin. And she would hold them like this. And then they would yawn. Did you see the teeth? If you saw the teeth, I want you to guess what Duncan eats. What kind of diet does a ferret have? So send those Q&As to Miss Mikey. What kind of diet? I'll try to show the teeth again. Look for that yawn. Yawn says meat. Meat, yes. Yawn says meat, meat. He is a carnivore. So he is a meat eater. So he has those sharp teeth. Oh, we have an escape artist. <laughs> Sharp teeth adapted to um, hunt and eat uh, meat and flesh. And they have really sharp claws, which I'll try to show you. Oh, your tail stuck, buddy. Okay. This is Yo-Yo. Yo-Yo has sharp claws to also hunt animals. Their favorite animal to hunt is rabbits. And rabbits live in warrens, which is a series of tunnels and rooms underground. So a bunch of burrows. And they'll go down a rabbit burrow and they don't get stuck in the tunnel because they've adapted to flip flop in half. And they can flip flop this way. And he can flip flop that way. So he's super bendy and flexible. Remember though, just like the tortoise in the shell, he has this backbone running down his spine. This is his vertebrae. And I actually have the backbone from a couple of mammals that died. So here is the spine from a dog. So this is their backbone. It would run from the neck all the way to your tailbone. You have a bone just like it. And you can see this one's shaped like an arch. So how come he can bend in half without breaking his spine? Well, you might notice this almost looks like little blocks that have been put together. Not one long piece, but it's in parts. Our spines and backbones are made out of vertebrae. So this is long bones that are connected by cartilage. Cartilage is what's in your nose and your ears. It's flexible and bendy. And it allows our ferrets to bend all around without breaking that backbone because it's actually a series of bones connected down the back. But they've adapted to be even more flexible than we are so they can hunt rabbits. You will not find this guy in the wild. <laughs> he's super cute, but he's a domestic species. That means that we, thousands of years ago, humans, saw an animal that was really good at hunting, had these amazing adaptations, and we decided that we wanted to use them to help us hunt. So what we did, is we bred them and we selected specific adaptations, specific qualities that they had, behaviors and physical body parts. And we um, sort of picked animals with those features exaggerated and had their babies and made them a perfect little hunting helper. 
So what we would do is we'd send a ferret down a rabbit hole and we'd wait with a basket on the other end. And when the ferret flushed the rabbit out, we were there to catch it. And then they would help us hunt. We don't really use them to hunt ferret very often. Some people in Europe, I think, still do. But what we use them for nowadays is things like running media cables and wires through walls and underground. Um, they use them at Buckingham Palace for Prince Charles and Princess Diana's wedding. We use them to clean particle accelerators. So big tubes, these scientific machines, will put a harness and a brush on a ferret and send them through those tubes. Oh, I'm so sorry, yo-yo. <laughs> and it'll come out clean on the other side. Even though they're domestic and they were bred to be our companions, we can't have them as pets because they're such good hunters. If anyone has a dog or a cat at home, especially cats, if you let them out, sometimes they'll bring you back presents that you didn't ask for, like dead mice or birds. I had a cat that liked to hunt cockroaches and salamanders. If we let these guys out, they'd be such good hunters that they would kill all our amazing songbirds and species that live here in California. Um, California is the second most biodiverse state. Hawaii is number one. That means we have more plants and animals than any other state except for Hawaii. And if these animals got out and killed those animals and killed, if ferrets got out and killed wild animals, we wouldn't be able to find them anywhere else. Um, California is really special. So unfortunately, they're just going to be here at the zoo <laughs> trying to stay safe. Um, other adaptations they have for hunting are really good ears that nose for sniffins and these whiskers. The whiskers are the same width as their body. So they stick their head in a hole and if their whiskers don't fit, they know the rest of their body won't fit and they'll pull their head out before they get stuck. So they actually use it to measure whether they can fit or not. Um, they don't have very good eyesight. They've adapted to be crepuscular. That means they're awake at dawn and dusk. So that's when rabbits and other animals that they eat are awake in the early morning and the late evening. So they sleep 18 to 20 hours a day. <laughs> but then when they're up, see, you're so silly. They're up, they're ferreting around, and they're super crazy. Ferret actually means thief. So if they find something shiny that they want or a bouncy ball or something fun, they'll take it and they'll bring it back to their home. That means they ferret it away. So they're little thieves. <laughs> And they has these sharp teeth he's trying to chew on my hand, but it's just because he's so playful, huh? The females do something interesting. When they're ready to have babies, when they're ready to breed, they go into heat. That means they send out um, hormones, pheromones, signals to the boys that say, I'm ready to have a baby. And when they do that, they produce a hormone called estrogen. And they will keep producing estrogen until they are bred, until they have babies. And if they are not bred, they um, will develop something called aplastic anemia. That means so much estrogen will be pr pr produced, their blood cell count will go down, it will decrease, and they become anemic, they don't have enough blood, and they could actually die. So if you have um, a female in captivity, you have to make sure she's fixed, that you take out of her reproductive organs so she doesn't die. But we have two boys, so we don't have to worry about that happening to them. <laughs> They're super duper cute. Does anyone have any questions about them? We're getting questions, Mikey? Yeah, well, so the first question we have is, does he eat mice? He could. They're very opportunistic. So um, they will eat whatever they can get their mouth around um, or their claws on. <laughs> and they're not too picky when they're awake. They eat about, they can eat 10 times a day and they can catch rabbits that are bigger than them. So they could definitely catch a small mouse, but they'll catch anything. What we have here in America is the black-footed ferret, and they only eat prairie dogs. And I have a picture of a prairie dog behind me. Um, Miss Mikey set up our beautiful background. So this is a prairie dog, and they dig their burrows. You can see that prairie dogs have long claws for digging burrows. And these guys are domestic ferrets, so they would never be around prairie dogs, but our black-footed ferrets go down those prairie dog burrows, they eat the prairie dogs, and then they move into their homes. So
So they've adapted not to dig their own burrows, but to move into their prey's burrows, their prey's burrows to hide from predators that might want to eat a ferret. Another cool adaptation they have is maybe um, a bobcat or a big hawk or a bigger predator wants to come and eat them. They take a sniff. I can't smell it right now because I'm protected. Really, they are protected from me, what I might have. Um, take a big sniff. Oh my God. Stinky. They have something called musk. M U S K, musk. Um, and that is a smell that they make that is so stinky that if you went to take a bite, you would lose your appetite. You wouldn't want to eat it. They also use musk to communicate with each other. Remember, not good eyesight, really good nose. So they use that musk to communicate. Um, they are related to ermine, minks, fisher cats, and otters, and otters also make musk. Otters are super stinky, those river otters. Not a sea otter, but um, river otters are super musky. Any other questions, Ms. Yeah. Mikey? Can we do a couple of them just quick short answers? Yes. Yeah. Okay, how old is he? Ooh, they usually live seven to ten years. I think he's about four. Yep. Yeah. Four. And is Duncan, okay. Duncan's a year younger. Yeah. Let me pull Duncan back out because he's super jealous. Um, it's hard for me to hold both of them at the same time because they're so silly. But he's about three and he's about four. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, do their whiskers grow back if they fall off? Yeah, just like our hair. So um, it would hurt if their whiskers got pulled out, but they will shed them and regrow them. They're just a different type of hair. Okay, and then the last one we'll do right now is what other colors do they come in? Ooh, they come in lots of colors. Black, all brown, this is called sable. This is his special look. He actually used to be sable, but now all that's left is this little brown on top that can be completely white. Did I say silver and gray already? kind of reddish, so they have a wide range, but that's the domestic ferret. The black-footed ferret does not have a wide range of color. And actually, I wanted to add that these guys were domesticated in Europe, and European settlers brought something called a polecat, which is the animal they were domesticated from, brought polecats to New Zealand, which is an island full of beautiful birds. Those birds had never seen these guys before, and these guys, not, not specifically these two, but polecats, hunted certain songbirds almost to extinction. So that's why they're illegal. It's, it's pretty serious. But yeah, other questions? <laughs> um, just, <laughs> they are both boys. So <laughs> Brie wants to know if Yo-Yo is a princess because at the top of her head looks like a crown. Um, <laughs> he could be a prince, maybe. He's a he boy. could be a princess. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry, yes. Yeah, I mean, princess, like, princess Diva S. Okay, um, Diva, we have, uh, uh, for Easter, he had his bunny in with him. They're basically princesses because they get whatever they want. <laughs> Here at the zoo, they get lots of playtime, lots of snacks. He loves to sleep. He has big fluffy beds and sheets. He's basically treated like a princess. So yeah, yo-yo princess, I love that. Cool, okay, and then we'll just pop out one more time. Yeah, okay. um, Mikey will wrap up. Thank you guys for your questions. It's so good to see you and to get these guys out. They really, really miss you, um, but bye guys. <laughs> okay so that's all the animals we have for today but like i said this was our first um zoom uh zoo time with mikey and molly and next week we're gonna be back with um, a different set of animals and different talking points um so just to kind of reiterate a couple things um if you have any feedback for us just about how the layout went or your thoughts or anything you can actually change to an anonymous user and then feel free to send those um, to our questions and answers right now. Um, we have a list of all the questions that we didn't get to, so at some point we'll send out an email kind of covering anything that we didn't get to check on. Um, I was able to check on Zeus. Weird story. Okay, so we got Zeus in 2000, but we didn't have an age on him when we acquired him. So our age is a guesstimate, and the zoo places him at about 35 right now. Uh, but we could be 
wrong or way wrong. I don't know. Um, but about, again, they use those scoots and they can tell different things. Like on dogs, they can check their teeth to give signs of age. There are different things that can check the signs. So they place them at about 35. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that we wanted to talk about adaptations today because um, just like animals adapt, we are all adapting right now too. And you guys um, being on Zoom with us is fantastic, but it's, it's different, right? We're normally like in a class together or can come visit you at your school. So we just wanted to say thank you so much for adapting with us. Um, and you can think that you, you're actually doing exactly what the animals are doing. You're doing um, what you can to keep yourself really safe and healthy and to survive. And so we're all doing that together and that we're so, so glad to have so many of you guys join us um, and be here with us. So um, we're, like I said, we have about, we're trying to run classes doing this at least through the end of May. Um, so Molly and I will be back with you next week with new animals and um, new cool things to talk about. Okay. Thank you guys so very much. Um, stay safe and we'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye.